Great. Okay. Well, welcome. I think we are live. I'm going to give it a few seconds to make sure, sure. the delays are good. Uh, we apologize that we are about five minutes behind. We're having some technical difficulties. So if for some reason we just drop off, we do apologize and we will make sure to reschedule. But for now, it looks like we're doing well. Um, welcome everyone, I'm Jennifer Storm. I'm with the National Crime Victim Law Institute. And this is our monthly series where we talk about rights in action and the difference that a lawyer can make. We've been doing this series all year long where we've literally been virtually traveling into all of the states that have a RISE clinic. And that is a clinic that has lawyers that is helping crime victims assert their rights in the criminal system. So we're really excited. This is our final one of the year uh, and we're super excited to be going to DC. And we've got Matt with us and Matt is gonna talk about the network for victim recovery in DC. Give us a little bit of insight into the, the clients they see, the work that they do uh, and just really bring home the reason that we want more lawyers. We need more lawyers in the courtroom advocating for crime victims. And when I say courtroom, I'm specifically saying in that criminal context, right? So Matt, welcome. And thank you so much for being here in, in despite your technical difficulties. Yes, th thank you so much for having me. I, um, I do apologize for running a little bit late over here. You are totally fine. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and your RISE Clinic's background. Yeah, sure. So I, so my name is Matthew Ornstein. I'm the Director of Litigation and Enforcement at Network for Victim Recovery of DC. And so I, I've been involved with uh, with victims' rights for a good while now. Um, so I, I've been at NVRDC since 2012. And before that, I was at the, the Maryland Crime Victims Resource Center. Um, so I, I've been at it for a while. Um, NVRDC is a, is, a, is a clinic like many of the other ones. Um, you know, throughout the country, we're really focused on crime victims' rights. And, you know, in addition to our, our legal program, we also have an advocacy program that, that works with sexual assault victims in the hospital. Um, but, our, but our legal program is focused, again, on, on crime victims' rights in criminal proceedings, in criminal cases. And what's really great about our organization and, and being in D.C. is that we get to practice under the, the Federal Crime Victims' Rights Act, which is, which is wonderful. So we also have a local version as well. So we have two different statutes to pull from. And and between the two of them, we have a lot of rights and a lot of access to the court. So we get to, to mix it up a little bit and really advocate for our clients. Wonderful. Well, we're so grateful for all that you do. Uh, with respect to confidentiality, we understand you can't go into details about any respective case. But can you just tell us a little bit maybe about a recent case or a combination of cases that you have recently worked on where a victim's rights were at issue and you helped navigate the criminal justice system for that victim? Yeah, I you know the the one that really springs to mind a, in recent memory, we had a we had a case going forward. It was sort of in a, in a trial posture, but even as we were sort of winding up, like so, we're in the right after the arrest has been made, and our you know our defendant is is on pretrial release, and we're in that sort of phase where like the motions are just starting to get going, and the discovery is going back and forth, and you know here in D.C. It, you know at this point in time, almost all of the hearings are done remotely. And they're still really done remotely if the court can. So all the, you know, all the lawyers are, are calling in, the parties are calling in. And, it, it, you know, it's been an interesting experience with COVID in general with doing that. Um, but it really sort of highlights who's there. You know, it, in, if we're all in regular court. Everyone comes in, we sit in the gallery, we sit behind, um, you know, in the, in the, sit behind the well. And it's just sort of business as usual. And there's not too much focus on it. But when when you're online and everyone sort of jumps in and everyone's got their own window, it's a, you know, Matt Ornstein victims counsel, and you can see who the attorneys are. So in this, in this particular case, I think it be sort of because of that defense counsel saw that our attorney was, was present at a hearing and said, you know, who is this, you know, why are they here? And our attorney's like, well, you know, we ended our appearance and um, you know, we're victims counsel and the defense wasn't like, no, no, I know who you are, but like, why are you in this hearing? And, you know, we're, we say we go to every hearing like that's we always do. <laughs> yep. And you know, so their issue was that somehow our presence was a violation of the rule of witnesses. Now, like, you know, over the years, I've had defense counsel or, or I mean, really defense counsel. I mean, sometimes the government it's usually defense counsel makes some mention of the fact that hey, victims counsels in the courtroom and the rule on witnesses has, has been invoked. And again, we're, we're pretrial. So this is not in the middle of a trial. Mm -hmm. um, but same point. Um, and our response has usually been, you know, Your Honor, I'm an officer of the court. I understand what the, the rule on witnesses is, and we should be treated like any other attorney in any other case, and it really won't be a problem or an issue. And defense counsel, 
made basically made an argument that we would be compelled by our attorney client relationship to violate the rule on witnesses like that effectively we had no choice but to tell our clients factual details of what might go on in court that they might not have been aware of otherwise and you know disturb their testimony so it was a it was a really interesting sort of way that they came about it and we ended up you know sort of litigating and going back and forth and it really came down to the right to be present and effectively we argued that we should be treated the same way that our client would be if our client wanted to step into the courtroom and that if you want to, to remove us, that there's a high standard under the Crime Victims Rights Act to do so. It's not like a hand wave kind of thing. You know, the, the rule of witness is a very common, um, it's a very common procedure. And so I, I think a lot of times people invoke and then everyone just sort of steps out. And so we really had to explain it like, that is just not how this works here. Like there's, there's a burden of proof. It's a factual burden that if the other side has to make articulated arguments about why our client's testimony was going to be tainted. And then they had to narrowly craft sort of what their exclusion was going to be um, to, you know, to have the most minimal impact on effectively our clients present. And so we went back and forth with that. And it was just, a, it was a really interesting argument just because I had never really been a part of that before. And the court sort of wanted to craft a protective order. And we were like, you can't craft a protective order. Like, you know, you're, you're treating us different than everyone who would treat everybody else. And there's just absolutely no way that if our client wasn't represented, they would have been able to deal with any of this. It was a lot of back and forth with chambers. There was motions over it. And at the end of the day, we really ended up basically in the same place as if the whole thing had never happened. Um, mm -hmm. But it took a really long way to get there. And a, a lot of the hearings that we attended did involve substantive rights belonging to our client, really that related to safety. I mean, it was the the pretrial release conditions and sort of the evolution of what where our client wasn't allowed to be or where the defendant wasn't allowed to be that we were so interested in and our our client would have just been completely removed from these proceedings like just just whole scale if we weren't there to really articulate the, the nuance there yeah and i would imagine i mean thankfully you were there but i would imagine you know if a victim is is in an environment like that especially a zoom environment where right there's a little bit of a, a layer of kind of feeling removed and then they're they're kind of having all these legal terms thrown around and motions filed. It's it's impossible for a survivor or a victim unless they are also a lawyer. <laughs> but let's be honest, when you're when you're in a space without your lawyer hat on and you're there as a victim or or a survivor, you're also maybe not thinking about all of the legal things that you've learned. It, you know, it, like you had mentioned, how how is it even possible that a victim or a survivor could have asserted their own rights in that moment and could have truly realized what the crime victims' rights afford them without a lawyer there? I mean, there's just no way. I mean, the court just flat out would have excluded them from the courtroom based on um, the defense's proffer just on its face. And, you know, the right to be present in the courtroom and the right to be heard is such a gatekeeping due process scenario exactly for this reason. If you're not present and you don't have the right to sort of hear what's going on in court, you just have no ability to advocate for yourself. And, you know, our our court here in D.C. is is very sort of proactive about you know, defendants' rights and the, it's very, it's just very sensitive, I think, to the arguments of the, of the defense bar, you know, for right or wrong. It, but victims, like, they're, they're just some hearings that I think probably any court is going to say, you're going to be a witness in this case that you're not going to be able to sit, sit for. And mm -hmm. just even getting into the facts, it's a factual decision in, under our standard about whether somebody's testimony is going to be tainted or not. But you, to even have that argument, you need to hear what the other side is saying you're going to hear. So if you're a victim dealing with that issue, there's just no way the court is going to really give you the information that you need to, to advocate for yourself. You just have to have somebody else. Understood for sure. So talk a little bit about what has it been like to work with NCBLI and what type of technical assistance have they been able to provide for you as you have either been, you know, working on specific cases or even just in general, you know, how has NCBLI been a good partner for you? I, so NCVLI has been been wonderful. And this case is a really good example of the kind of interconnectivity that you really need to sort of develop this law. And it, it's very rare that there's going to be appellate cases really based on victims' rights. And if there's not appellate cases, there's not going to be published opinion. So it's hard for a practitioner, I think, in any jurisdiction to sort of jump on Lexis or West and like find real substantive law on these issues. And again, like, the, the issue that I was just explaining that we dealt with, like, there's not going to be any published opinion on that. Mm -hmm. And so the only way that you would sort of get, be able to crowdsource arguments or hear what sort of has worked and what hasn't is 
You have a technical provider like NCVLI who's hooked into these clinics across the country, who gets these technical assistance requests and absorbs information. And I mean, that's exactly what we did here when this whole thing started. We, we put in our request and we said, you know, help us out. And the, the case law and the examples and the, the arguments that we got from NCVLI, you know, even if it doesn't exactly line up with our law, the, the heart and the core of it is enough to really get us going. And so like we benefited tremendously by just having that as a resource to sort of frame our arguments and um, you know, just make a more sophisticated argument about why should we, we should be allowed to stay present. Well, it makes a lot of sense. And we appreciate so much the good work that you're doing there in DC on behalf of crime victims and survivors. So where can individuals learn more about you? How can they engage your services? So we have our website. So it's nvrdc.org. And I think I've got my little background up. So that's nvrdc. Uh, I, I think our website is probably the best. We have a lot of information up there just about our organization and our services and who we are. And, you know, we also do have a, a pretty um, robust social media presence these days. So we're on um, on Twitter and Facebook and, and that kind of thing. Um, we are directly hooked into the um, DC, the city of DC sexual assault crisis response project. So if somebody calls, you know, the um, basically the, the victim hotline after having been the victim of a a sexual assault or um, request an advocate for the community response in DC, doing one of those things will directly hook you into NBRDC as well. That's an excellent resource and a, and a great nexus for survivors and victims. So again, Matt, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for your expertise and as always what you do for victims. And thank you. This is, as I said, our final um, episode in this series of The Difference a Lawyer Makes. However, we will be back in January in 2022 uh, with a whole new series where we're going to be looking at victims' rights from a different lens. Until then, we thank you for you know coming on to these events, to, to listening and being open to learning more. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that it is the end of the year and we are in the middle of our annual fund. We are $10,000 away from our goal of hitting $25,000. So if you find it in your heart, in your wallet, um, when you're making year-end donations, because it's always a great time to make that final tax deductible donation to a nonprofit organization, we just ask that you consider the National Crime Victim Law Institute because it allows us to continue to do the good work that supports this amazing work that's happening on the ground so that crime victims are having their rights realized, activated, and afforded in every moment while they're in court. Uh, so if you have it in your heart and your wallet, please donate to NCVLI today. You can find information on our Facebook page, also on our website uh, under our annual fund. And until next year, thank you. Stay safe and enjoy any holiday that you might be celebrating. Thank you. Take care. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Matt.